In the previous lecture, we discussed that uh, Newtonian scheme requires the reaction forces of the constraint, and we can do better. We can do better in the sense that we can just specify the constraint relations and get the equation of motion. But to do that, we need to understand what are the constraints and what kind of constraints we have. Uh, or in other words, we need to classify the constraints based on certain criteria. Once we classify the constraint, we will better understand which one we can treat mathematically and which ones we cannot. Uh, so that way, at least we can classify our problems as tractable, not tractable, this way. So, the constraints, they can be classified using a variety of criteria. One of the most common criteria is the whether the constraint involves time or not. Let's take a simple constraint. Uh, say, for example, uh, this pin, the motor, it is now constrained to move on this plane. It can't leave the plane. So it requires only x and y coordinate. And let us suppose this contains the origin, and this is the z direction. So in that case, I can simply say for this marker, z equal to zero is the constraint. That is the constraint. That is the constraint equation. Okay. So such relation we can denote it like g is a notation for that equation. So g refers to z equal to zero equation. Or we can give subscript also. g1 is this. Is there any other constraint? Is there a G2? Um, for this one, yeah, no. I mean, it looks like Z1 is good enough. Okay. Now, this equation, does it involve time? It does not involve time. So, constraint equation, which are not functions of time, we call them scleronomic. So, we check whether it's a constraint relation is a function of time. If it is no, then it is scleronomic. What about if it is yes, then it's rheonomic. An example? Example is uh, many. I mean, the simplest example is assume this board, it starts moving out while I'm moving the pain of it. So then there will not be zero all the time as the board is moving out and let us suppose somebody else moving the board. He knows he is maintaining some function of time. Okay. The, the coordinate is changing as a function of time. Um, then here it would be a function of time and z1 would be a function of time and we will call this constraint is real. If it is difficult to imagine, a uh, good example is the floor of an elevator, a lift. Any object which is sitting on the floor when the lift is not moving, for that let us suppose we define that is the z equal to zero plane. Then the constraint is scleronomic. But if the lift stirs, first it is accelerating, then there is a constant velocity per, then it's decelerating. So there is a known function of time for the motion of the lift. Then the object which is on the floor of the lift, for that we will have z to be some function of time, so it will be a realomic constraint. The constraints can also be classified based on whether they are function of, let's say, last. So we ask this question again, is it a function of velocity? If the answer is no, it's not a function of velocity, such constraints are called holonomic. Although the holonomic means uh, integrable. Now, uh, suppose you have a constraint, say, 
x dot plus y dot equal to some number c. Suppose this is the open string. You say, I mean, I can simply integrate it and to get that x, after the integration, you get x plus y equal to c times t uh, plus uh, some initial condition, let's say c prime at the constant. So instead of writing this, this would be a good example. You can, I mean, write it. This is good example means if you can integrate it, you integrate it. If you do that, then there is no speed or velocity anywhere in the constraint. If you can do that, then these constraints are integrable. You could integrate it. So if you can integrate it, then this is holonomic. So the question could be as well, integrable, just position and time possibly, no velocity. If the answer is yes, then it is holonomic. So you can ask the question either way. Is it a function of velocity or speed of individual x dot, y dot, z dot? Or is it integrable? If this answer is no and that answer is yes, then it's full. In this case, <laughs> the nomenclature is simple, no new word. It's just non holonomic. It's not holonomic. Okay. Um, an example of non holonomic constraint is suppose you have a rolling disc, rolling without slipping. Now, if the disc is moving on a straight line, let's say it's moving along, it's moving along x, it's moving along x. Forgive my straight lines, I mean they're not straight anymore, but okay, we can leave with that possibly. Now, if the speed is say x dot along this direction, then you have done countless examples, you would be able to say x dot equal to r theta dot where theta is the angle of some predetermined point on the periphery of this disk and r is the radius of the disk. Then x dot is r theta dot. Straightforward. This is remember, this is integrated. So I'm assuming the disk is moving along a straight line. But uh, in general, a disk may not move along a straight line. It may wiggle, it may change direction. I particularly remember when you are, say, suppose, rolling a coin, the coin often changes directions. So, in general, it should not be the case. A general case of disc rolling on a surface should be more like What is happening is this, the disc is rolling on the surface along say, this direction which makes an angle phi with respect to x. This is suppose our y direction. So in, with respect to x and y, the disc is making some angle with respect to x, it's making an angle phi. So in that case, if it wiggles, then phi would be a function of time. And then, if phi is a function of time, which is true in general, then this is not integrable anymore. If we did not have this phi part, then we saw this is integrable. But uh, with this phi, we can't integrate it. In that case, this is a good example of non holonomic constraint. It has velocity and it cannot be removed from the equation. Okay. Are there other classifications? Yes, there are two other ways we can classify the constraint. Um, I will simply erase the first one. We can also ask this question whether 
the system is conservative or dissipative. The constraints are similarly named. If the system is conservative, then it is called conservative. The constraint is conservative. If the constraint is such that the system dissipates energy, it gains energy or loses energy, although dissipation typically says that uh, losing energy. So in that case, you can say, I mean, probably a better nomenclature would be conservative and non-conservative. Okay. Example. Okay. Suppose you have a box, a square box, a 3D box, and you have an object, a gas molecule, which is inside the box and colliding with the surface. If all collisions are elastic, the box is not doing anything. Then it's a conservative system because uh, the energy of the molecule is not going to change uh, no matter how many times it collides. The energy is conserved. It's fine, conservative. Is that, uh, but what about if we push the walls of the box, make it collapse, make the volume small? Now you see while the molecule is going this way, the wall is moving towards inside, the wall is moving inside, then upon collision, the molecule will gain energy. Its momentum will not be same as before the collision, it will be more now. And then once it goes to the other wall, the same thing will happen. For collapsing wall, the energy of the molecule inside will grow. Or if you are expanding the wall, the molecule goes and it's also moving the same way, obviously, the uh, returning molecule after the collision, it will have less speed, so it will lose energy. Either way, if the box has a variable size, the size is changing with time, then it's not a conservative system anymore. So such constraint, I mean, we will classify an expanding box or collapsing box to be a system with non-conservative constraints. Okay. So, I mean, I should write, I mean, conservative, yes, then it is the word conservative, no, then it is the same word, non-conservative. Okay. There is yet another classification, uh, that too is a quite uh, encountered often. It's called unilateral or bilateral. So, this definition, is more mathematical. Mathematical in the sense that you ask the question whether the equation of the constraint is given by an equality or inequality. If the given if it is given by equality, then you call it bilateral. If it is given by an inequality, equality now, then you call unilateral. Example, again, the box could be a good example. I mean, we take uh, a simple billiard ball on a billiard table. The billiard ball is on a table. Suppose this is A and this is B. How do I write the constraint of the ball? It's not free, it's confined within this box. It can go, collide, come back but it can't leave the billiard table A. So one way of writing that, the x, y coordinate, let's suppose this is x and this is y, then I can say the constraint would be given by the mod x less than or equal to a by 2 and mod y less than or equal to z by 2. And you mean the origin is exactly at the middle. Okay. These are the constraints. So x cannot be less than minus a by 2 not greater than plus a by 2. And the equality holds when it's exactly hitting the, you know, the wall. So in such cases, we have two constraints. This would be like, let's say, g1 and g2. Two constraints. And they are not given by equality. As such, this would be unilateral. And otherwise, I mean, that uh, the constraint, suppose we remove the ball, then this ball is, suppose it is forced to move on this surface and the constraint is given by only one constraint, g1 equivalent to 
is equal to 0. In that case, this is an equality, so we would call it bilateral. So these are the types of constraints that we encounter. Now, um, could it be, uh, suppose we are given a constraint, uh, when we try to classify it, could it be a mixture? Of course it could be a mixture. Say for example, remember that box, the box, the gas molecule inside the box, it was conservative and it was immutable because of the inequalities. And then if the box is expanding, it would be non-conservative, yet it would be unilateral. So, in, in general, uh, you can have a single constraint, it could be classified into using multiple keywords. So, we will uh, not discuss more examples, we have taken up one example of each kind, and so that should conclude our classification of constraints.